Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed. And yes, I was strong-armed, you're quite right. But anyway, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Protection of Rex Act panel discussion. It gives me enormous pleasure uh, and it's a great honour to be here today, uh, chairing this session. And without further ado, I'm going to get on and ask the panellists to introduce themselves and answer the following questions. And they've each got two minutes. The Protection of Rex Act, 1973, has it worked? What are the good points and bad points about the Act? And what are the successes and failures during the 50 years? So we're going to deal with that to start with and hear what everybody says. So we're going to start, and I'm going to start by asking Terry, uh, Terry Newman of Historic England, to open the batting, please. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Terry Newman, and I'm the maritime archaeologist on the National Listing and Marine Team at Historic England. Um, my primary role, realistically, is to um, administer the licensing system for our protective rec sites on behalf of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Um, so what's the Act done? Well, effectively, it created designated and protect or protected areas around our maritime archaeological sites that are of national importance. And what has it told us? It told us basically what we can't do except under the authority of a licence. Um, and that, in essence, is what the Act is. What its impact has been is that it's created the, the largest group of volunteers within historic England, with some 200 people devoting their time, their money and their enthusiasm to our protective rec sites. This has meant that our, the sites are regularly monitored, which does provide a deterrent to unauthorised access in part. It provides regular data on the condition of the sites and enables informed decision making with regard to the management of those sites. Historic England is also then able to provide funds for site specific projects and also encourage international cooperation, which we've seen with the Roosevig and the unknown wreck Eastbourne or the Kleinhelandia, with our partners from the Netherlands Cultural or Agency, the RCE, and also uh, in respect of the London excavation. It allows well, a mechanism for divers to report discoveries to, histor uh, to Historic England for consideration for protection. Uh, and examples of that would be the two Shingles Bank sites and the Klein Hollandia, um, which were designated after being discovered by divers. Probably importantly, it also allows Historic England to provide funds for projects to tackle the archives once um, the physical work has been done on the sites. Um, and that includes the Sterling Castle Archive, which was done by the Marica Maritime Archaeological, Archaeological Trust, and the finds recorded for the Royal Anne Galley, uh, galley um, done by Kevin Camage and David Gibbons. Terry, We've also, yeah, Terry, I suspect you're getting quite near your two minutes. Okay, absolutely. Um, and, and basically, it's also allowed us to, to start uploading the licensee reports as grey literature to Oasis, which brings the work of the licensees to a wider audience. Um, okay. Can we maybe move on? Yeah, absolutely. We come back. You've got lots of time for discussion later. For sure. Uh, um, Phil Robertson from Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland. Over to you. <clears throat> yeah, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, I'm Philip Robertson. So I'm a, in a former life, I, I used to run NAS training field schools from our dive centre in the Sand of Mull uh, on the west coast of Scotland. Um, but for the last 15 years or so, I've been um, heading up maritime archaeology at Historic Environment Scotland. So, and that includes managing a range of projects on uh, protected wrecks in Scottish waters. I should start, I guess, by saying that I feel a bit of an interloper in this discussion about whether the Protection of Wrecks Act works. As section one of the acts, the bit that deals with historic wrecks, is no longer in force in Scotland. Um, in the years following devolution, Scotland took the decision to replace it with our system of marine protected areas. And at the time, I guess there were proposals across the UK to legislate the change, and our feeling was that it was excessively restrictive. Uh, in the event, Scotland was the only part of the UK to move forward with changes at that time. 
So by 2013, all the previous protected wrecks under the 73 Act became what we call historic marine protected areas, or they were de-designated altogether. So while the rest of the UK is celebrating a golden jubilee, I guess um, in Scotland we're celebrating a rather less salubrious tin or tent anniversary. Um, I guess the good points, uh, there's so many, um, it's been the major mechanism that's regulated um, the investigation and protection of Scotland's underwater heritage over the last 50, 50 or so years. Um, as Colin's talk so ably uh, outlined, major increases in knowledge um, and protecting sites from damage and loss due to uncontrolled salvage. Much of this strength, of course, lies in the dedication of licensees and stewardship of the wrecks often giving time and effort for little in return. For me, a few bad points quickly, just the sense of division. The administration of the Act engendered, engendered perhaps the idea that wrecks were somehow different from the rest of our heritage, something that Peter alluded to. Um, for us, a perception that it was excessively restrictive, um, for example, by limiting access to license holders alone. Divers would find sites and then perceive that they were being excluded. Um, I feel, for me, that created an atmosphere of secrecy and mistrust. Bill, we're going to yeah. have to move on. Absolutely, that's taken a lot to break down through the good auspices of the NAS and the Diving Association. Thank you, Thank you Phil. Go now to Colin Dunlop uh, of Deira of Northern Ireland. Uh, yeah, my name's Colin Dunlop. Um, so I'm the Marine Heritage Advisor for Northern Ireland, pretty much acting in the same situation as, uh, as some of the other guys in this um, call. Um, so I suppose uh, just to say that Northern Ireland only has one REC designated under the protection REC sex, that is the Girona, which my colleague uh, Roy McNary will be giving you a full lecture on later on. Um, so in terms of positives, when the Girona was um, basically protected under the Act, it stopped most divers going down and basically trying to find the last bits of treasure because it's unlike many of the wrecks we've talked about, there is no wreck. It is the location of the shipwreck, so it is really just artifacts that are left on the seabed. Um, and it has to be said that the flaws that were in the act that I can see are that one of the divers who had the license uh, was still using it as his personal treasure trove. And the act, uh, as the license was given to him, he actually ended up heading off and selling it on the open market, the object that he found. And we had nothing to do, with nothing we could do to get that back without having to pay a large sum of money from our museum. The other flaw I can see, and this is from my work I've been doing over the last year, I've been looking through a lot of our old records, the bar is set so high, to actually something under the Protection Rex Act, we had at least four vessels which were flat out refused to be uh, granted permission to be added to the list. Um, and I think that's a bit of a flaw in the Act that it really is looking at the very pinnacle of excellence and the boats that are, you know, basically if it's not 16th century, 17th century wooden wreck with lots of cannons on board, it's essentially ignored and our wrecks are so much more than that. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, that was very timely. Colin, thank you very much indeed. Julie. Julie Satchel. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been, I suppose, fortunate through my work with Maritime Archaeology Trust and over the years been involved in protected wrecks in a, in a number of different capacities. Um, just to try and um, touch on some of the things, I suppose, that, we, that might not have been mentioned so far. Um, obviously, we've, we've heard how it was successful in obviously designating um, specific historic uh, wreck sites. Um, and I guess through those and the associated licensing and conditions, um, those have evolved very much over the last 50 years and it might be interesting to see how those have evolved in terms of um, aligning work more with archaeological best practice over the years again volunteer involvement is just is amazing and what what is contributed and gets done it is it's it is a real something that the uk should shout about more because i think um when you look across uh, Europe more widely there's not that same sort of tradition of involvement and so it, i think it's something that we should be um really proud of the Act's obviously been used very sparingly, as Colin touched on, that, that doesn't really give much, any protection for things of particular local and regional significance, so there's a gap there. Um, the Obviously, the lack of funding that came with that Act as the emergency legislation means that um, 
that's uh, impacted um, over the years with money spent um, on monitoring and initial assessment. Some lack of support for ongoing for future for other work for assessment analysis and publication in the past means there's a big backlog of early um, protected rec archives and they can be kind of split between locations with not much security as well. Um, and so um, not always the research potential of the site's been fully realised and obviously that impacts for research and also for um, public access and enjoyment as well. Um, so some impacts um, through there. And I think we've already touched on the fact that um, that having that separate marine legislation has kind of it's kind of perpetuated that separation from terrestrial archaeology, which um, has impacted over the years as well. Thank you very much indeed, Julie. That was very, very timely. Can we move on to Dave Parham, Dr. David Parham, Bournemouth University? Mr. David Parham, because oh. I'm not a doctor. Oh. <laughs> Just to confirm that, um, uh, like everybody else here, I suppose I've had a range of roles within the Act, um, from a member of the advisory panel to licensee to diver. I think it's an interesting point as a grey-haired man who's almost 60, I'm one of the youngest licensees, which shows really that the licensee system has been extremely effective in the past, and I think there's been a massive strength of it and has brought me to meet some of the best people uh, I've ever met, and some of the worst as well. But it is something that is a almost a dying breed now, so that particular strength of it may well wither and disappear. Uh, in terms of the act itself, I think it was game change at the time. It has been very effective. It is, however, limited to wrecks not so much tanks or landscapes of aircraft, although the Ancient Monuments and Areas Act now deals with those in a different way. I think the having a licence to dive on the site of it has been a strength and a problem because there are some places where limited access because of vulnerability of the site or work on the site is desirable and in other places where they'd just be better if people were allowed to, to dive uh, or visit as and when they, they wanted to, really. Um, its protection is limited in that it limits human access and activities on the site. But the biggest threat to, to rec sites in the UK is the natural environment. And it doesn't deal with that at all. And as Julie, I think, uh, alluded to, the lack of funding that came with the Act at the I, beginning Dave, I, um, I have, I did have is an issue with issue. that. Right, finished, Bob. OK, thanks very much indeed. Um, Jane, over to you. Two minutes. She's muted. I've Jane, you're muted. Unmute, Jane. Still muted. Can you unmute? Yes. I'm trying. Oh, well done. Good. Right. Uh, so I'm looking at it um, from the concept of a recreational diver. I think one of the successes was very much that it was a very formal recognition that wrecks actually did need protection and they were not a souvenir gathering opportunity if they had sufficient importance. Um, and I think that had a knock-on effect in a way because for many divers, it became the whole idea that, that a vessel on this protection would have a nominated archaeologist, would have a principal licensee, and that's when you actually appeared on this wreck, there would be some form of structure in the way which you dived it, recorded it, and sent in your records. So there was an opportunity for a lot of divers to be taught for what in Brent word I would call right principles, proper principles. Um, and I think... Jane, Jane, can you turn your video off? Because one of the knock-on effects was 100 divers, so many things. Sorry? Yes, that's better. Oh. We were right. losing your sound. That's okay. I'm losing you as well, but never mind. Okay. Uh, I'll just talk louder. Um, so I think we had a lot of opportunity there to take people into a, pro a, a better way of thinking about wrecks. Um, so then we look at the Mary Rose. Subsequently, we look at the NES training, which I think has had an enormous benefit, which I could say was a knock-on from the need to, to dive these wrecks properly. I think now that picking up on something Dave said, where we're actually looking at 
the new wave of protections in which Alison Mayer played a big part, getting things protected as scheduled as ancient monuments. Um, I think we're into a slightly different ball game. And if I was going to move it forward, we have all the challenges of not being funded. But we also have opportunities within that, that we can actually bring wreck interaction in a much less formal way to a, a whole host of new divers. Um, it needs managing. It's not going to be easy. It is the way forward. And I actually think that, again, picking up what someone else has already said, we are not going to preserve in situ. We can probably preserve by record. But to do that, we've got to get the people down there right. doing the recording. We'll get the cameras down there doing the recording. Thanks, so, Jane. Jane, I think is that about all? you can come back with other points later on. Thank you very no, much. I'm done. Peter, That's all I want to I'll say. Hi, I was at the Museum of London, uh, but uh, like everybody else, all this was done uh, as a volunteer. Uh, the Protection of Rex Act, there are some huge pluses. So the biggest one is that it recognised that Rex were a type of monument. And it brought in volunteers. There are some downsides. One is the lack of money, of course. Um, and also what happens to the pines? Um, there's a, an assumption that they will go into a museum. But I think they often go into people's garages there's a huge problem over where the archive goes, and one needs help with publication, particularly the volunteer groups. Um, on the uh, future, I would really do cast doubt on the need for two laws, the um, Ancient Monuments Act and the Protection of Rex Act. The latter sorry, the former, the, the Ancient Monuments Act, recognises wrecks on land sites as well. And that, that really is very important. But uh, the uh, land site law, the Ancient Monuments Law, would bring nautical archaeology or help to bring it into the, the home of, of British archaeology generally. Peter, that's very astute. Thank you very much. Can I move... Finally, to Mark, B.T. Edwards. Thank you, Bob. When, when thinking about the act, I kind of feel a little bipolar, to be honest, in terms of positives, negatives, my emotions. I've been a licensee for over a decade on a number of different sites, and I'm currently the licensee on two, and the nominated archaeologist for another, the London, supporting the licensee, Steve Ellis. I think my experience of the act over the 10 years has been, on the whole, a positive one. My time spent as licensee of Holland 5, Normans Bay, has allowed me to contribute to two nationally important heritage assets and, and build a better understanding. And I think encouraged access to the sites, probably with hundreds, if not a thousand people accessing the site and all the licensees that do that, that licensee mechanism that allows them to encourage and promote access uh, in a managed way, I think is the biggest success success story. Um, recently, my role as the licensee on the Klein Hollandia uh, working with the Dutch Heritage Agency has been incredibly positive. And I have to admit that when we first thought it might be Dutch on the very first dive we did, we were really excited that it might be Dutch because they have a very good track record of proactively supporting investigations. And maybe that's quite a sad situation that I was so pleased that it was Dutch. By comparison, working on the London has been a frustrating experience the slow and inevitable destruction of the wreck and the lack of uh, agency willingness to deal with or entertain ways in which the site might be dealt with uh, is incredibly frustrating. And I've had conversations with people working in this discipline for longer than I who've told me that we don't seem to have learned nothing, anything since the Stirling Castle situation many years ago. So to finish in my last 20 seconds, I think the biggest failure has been the adequate resourcing of the act, which other people have touched on. And we only have to look across the channel to Drasen in France to potentially see what proper resourcing might look like. So not enough has been fought for, I think, by central government from the Treasury. And now maybe that divide, that gap is just too big. Well, <clears throat> that was very, very timely. And thank you. I do apologise to people for cutting cutting them short, but we have more or less kept to um, our timetable so far. But we, we still want to talk about 
the successes and failures, and we can still talk about that for a little bit longer. Um, and given people's comments so far, would anybody like to come in and, and comment? Could I perhaps start by asking Kerry to respond to some of the comments? Uh, funding has been a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the one of the difficulties um, is the practicalities of policing the the act and applying the act when alleged offences are come to light. Um, in some way, that's mitigated by the site championship scheme, um, and we've got a, we're evolving a more coordinated approach with partner agencies such as the receiver of REC, the MMO and law enforcement agencies um, through a common enforcement manual which is coming out. And we also had the forensic marking um, project that um, was done during the course of this diving season, which is a crime prevention and deterrent. Um, and clearly funding is a very, very sensitive subject. Um, just put it in perspective, um, the funding for this year, 22-23, Historic Kingdom was in receipt of commission's budget of some £3.4 million. Pounds. And that's to look after 400,000 listing buildings, 20,000 scheduled sites and the 57 protected rec sites. The okay. maritime spend of that um, budget is in the region of £414,000, which is about 12% of that total, total budget. Um, what we have been able to do because of the Act is to provide funding, and the, the London's been mentioned. In the last 10 years, we've, we've provided some £560,000 worth of funding, and that doesn't include monies that were, were, were spent before that. Um, it's allowed us to provide training, not only to the licensee, but also to other volunteers as part of that project to fund an investigation into the site and survey of that site. Um, clearly, um, there are limitations to what we could do because of budgetary constraints. And we have to be seen to be targeting um, the monies that are available to us um, in a proper and um, informed way. Right. Because Terrible. clearly, we, we, we're asked the questions about how we spend that money. Terry, thank you very much. You've You've come up with funding and we've seen some figures and no doubt that's rather more than people expected. Could I go to Phil, Philip Robinson, sir? Uh, and you've really drawn the parallel with the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, which is your HPMA's uh, registration. Do you think, how do you think that compares to effectively what we do now in scheduling compared to the Protection Rex Act? Is it more effective or less effective? Um, so there's there's two things I would say, Bob. Um, there's the ancient monuments legislation, which um, the 1979 Act, which is the same. No, I didn't mean that. I meant your new HPMA as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, so the historic MPA designation was brought in as an attempt to align um, cultural heritage protection with marine nature conservation as part of a kind of single approach to recognition for our marine natural cultural heritage. Um, in terms of some of the differences, um, we we have a broadening in what types of sites we can protect. So to include things like artifact scatters to address the question around submerged landscapes. Um, there's a, a more flexible consent mechanism. So essentially we don't have to license um, visitor access just to look on a, a look that don't touch basis. But if we if we want to on particularly vulnerable sites, we can do so. So it, it, it brings in that sort of potential to have, I suppose, a graded approach to management. And um, there are higher higher degree of penalties. So I think it was interesting to see the kind of was it four hundred pounds for the limit now. I think we're up to um, a potential top limit for fines now on in our legislation of fifty thousand and. Think, um, did, you recent, say, did you say 50,000? Maximum fine of 50,000. Right, uh, so slightly different to 400 pounds. Essentially, the, the the two prosecutions in Scapa Flow that we, we took forward, um, 
I think two divers were fined eighteen thousand pounds each um, for for illegal recoveries from their site. So a, a much stronger deterrent. Um, there are a few other changes I would highlight, but these were essentially changes that were largely recommended through the reviews in the in the early two thousands. And the approach we took was just the best available tool at the time. I, mean, I would say it's not been without its challenges. Um, it's not been totally perfect, but I think we're so far a decade in happy enough. Thank you very much. That's, that's quite illuminating, isn't it? Um, but who else would like to chip in? I'm sure somebody would like to chip in before we yeah. start. Yeah, I was just going to say, just to follow that, yeah, just to, uh, to follow that for Phil. So, yeah, I mean, we have, uh, within the last year, scheduled two more shipwrecks. And again, we're scheduling under our own Historic Monuments Act, which is currently under review. Um, we are in an odd situation where our act specifically states we cannot license anything under the sea, and we cannot license anything which is owned by the Crown, which is most of under the sea but we can schedule a site so weirdly we can't license anyone to do it but we can give people scheduled consent to investigate but we also basically sh all our scheduled monuments are a look but don't touch basis we don't restrict anybody terrestrial or on the sea from visiting them but it is giving us a method of then um potentially taking someone to court if we find that they have remove the brass fittings from one of the world war ii wrecks and we can then positively say yeah this is from this one and you didn't have consent to do that um uh, i think it's fair to say that you know we are looking at extending that to more shipwrecks but we're in a bit of a limbo at the minute because um we don't know what's setting with the unesco convention and how the uk is going with ratifying that um but as a comparison, which might be of interest to everybody, the Republic of Ireland has just brought in a new Monuments Act within the last month, which has a proviso in it specifically aimed at them ratifying the UNESCO Convention, which has updated their Monuments Act in respect of that. So if anyone hasn't seen that, I could certainly recommend looking at it. And I'm sure we, as a neighbouring jurisdiction, will probably follow something along that line whenever we review our Monuments Act. Colin, that is extremely interesting. I think if you could just put a, a link into the chat so that we can all have that, because that uh, yep. and the reference to UNESCO Convention uh, is also interesting. And it's interesting that the JNAPC has recommended the reference to the UNESCO Convention in the Scottish Marine Bill as well. So uh, I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Um, we want to talk about how we've got half an hour left and we've got sort of two things to do. One is to talk about how we can go and move in the future, what we could do with the Protection Rex Act and the things that it should possibly be amended for or whatever, if you wish to say that. But then we're going to leave 15 minutes at the end for questions. So we've got 15 minutes. Would somebody like to start by suggesting um, what, what improvements could be made? What, what, is, what is the way forward for the, for the PWA 73? I'm happy, to, I'm happy to start, Bob, if you want. Yes, yes. Mark, over to you. I get mine in first and everyone else is. <laughs> uh, That's good. Well, I, I mean, in terms of in terms of changes to the act, I, I being uh, perhaps a realist, a pragmatist, I think the idea of getting parliamentary time to, to make changes to an act of parliament is probably very unlikely or it's very far into the future uh, in terms of the difficulty of getting getting that. I think my. I think my recommendations would be more to do with the thinking about how the act is administered, the management processes that go on um, to fulfil the the act, and whether or not those can be looked at in terms of um, changes made. Um, and I think that it was touched on in uh, by Jane uh, in, and maybe by Dave as well in terms of this um, uh, threats to sites, preservation by record, accepting that we can't save everything, we can't you know keep everything and and also that we can't keep everything stable on the seabed climate change changes in conditions modern development infrastructure developments so means that keeping things stable on the seabed um in the long term uh, is perhaps slightly fanciful and naive 
Uh, so changing the way in which people think about that in this sort of in situ, it must be in situ, it has to be in situ, there's no other way. That's not what the UNESCO Convention uh, says. And that's not what the annex says as, uh, um, at all. Um, and my other one um, I mean, uh, uh, is to do with the, the voyage of sites uh, and the way in which at the moment we're encouraged to, um, the Act encourages us, the A agencies encourage us to encourage access, to, to get the general public to in, in engage with their heritage, to touch their their heritage, to physically see it and, uh, and, and visit it. But the support that is given to licensees to do that is really minimal. And I mean, for over for over 10 years, I've been asking for and suggesting that conversations take place about how that access isn't just allowing visiting dive boats to throw shot weights overboard on site to let to get their visitors, their divers onto site um, and have many examples of damage being done, nearly being done, probably was done um, uh, and still no conversations. No one's no one wants to have that conversation. Uh, about it and, and and i think we we need to because licensees put themselves at risk of prosecution by causing damage to sites by encouraging access to them uh and i and i think that's unfair mark that's a very interesting practical point dave you've got quite a bit of experience what, what do you think is the way forward i quite like the uh, 1979 scheduled nature monuments areas act in that it allows access, it's easier to administrate. And I think a lot of the protected wrecks would probably be better off being protected by that, unless there's an issue about security or access or ongoing work on it, where perhaps a licensing system is, is better, really. To take up on Mark's point about public access and, and supporting people to do that, We've tried to do that with some of the sites in, in Pool Bay, and that's directly resulted in damage to the site, um, unfortunately. What, by people, oh, by people dropping shot on them? No, people moving boy mooring weights and hitting the site with it, or something moving boy mooring weights and hitting the site with it. Um, but I think the, the overall principle of making it easier for people to access these things and in a position where they're not dropping sh shot weights on it or tying ropes to the site is a very good idea and is relatively easy to sort out, but it does have a cost, which is which is the inherent problem with, with everything. Everything costs, um, and we don't have the funding to deal with, with all of those costs. And that's not the fault of the heritage agencies. That's the fault of the people that fund the heritage agencies. That's, who else would like to chip in with the way forward? Peter, I know we know your views because we've heard them earlier. Did I? Yes, yes. Is that Julie? So is Peter going to speak then? I, uh, yes, I was going to say, surely the whole business needs to be reviewed by, and I don't know, there's no overarching group there's northern ireland there's england there's scotland there's wales and each seem to be having a or england and wales i suppose is the same but each is going its own way surely the whole lot needs to be brought together under a um a review of the whole situation because there are all these other organizations which have an input into it as well uh i mentioned the custom and excise as just one uh, the Ministry of Defence, Department for Transport, uh, and and there are many others. So surely a review, but who would do that? I don't know, um, because that really at the top of it all, pinnacle, is Parliament. If I can jump in there. Yeah, Terry, you wanted to say. Yeah, um, there is in fact um, a critical review that's been done by CIFA. Um, and next Wednesday, the 22nd, there's a day's seminar on on that review where people will be able to give their um, to open about the act and how to take it forward. So that's funded by Historic England. Um, and hopefully from that, we'll be able to identify a way forward to be able to, to address the um, deficiencies um, in how we protect our uh, important sites. Um, 
historically they're not using scheduling more ex more broadly for sites um with a view to encouraging public access um but as dave has alluded to um we do have a two-tier system um where sites are particularly vulnerable to un unauthorized salvage for example the the client Hollandia with artifacts on the seabed um that is definitely uh, a candidate for um protection under the protection of rex act um where we've got other sites that uh, have been scheduled like the the d1 down in the southwest where because of its location uh, the difficulties in accessing the site and where potentially there's not movable objects that can be salvaged it um, lends itself more readily to scheduled site um, designation that's quite interesting. Just what we're saying is the two tiers where a site really needs proper protection because of its vulnerability, then the Protection Rex Act has really got the teeth to do that. Is that what you're saying, Terry? Um, Whereas yeah. scheduling it allows visitors and there's not so much to pinch effectively. Exactly. If you, you know, if there's stuff there that's worth nicking to to use that colloquialism, yes. then <laughs> it's, it, it's more it's better protected under the protection of Rex Act. I'm not entirely sure that the the Act has got teeth, and I think that's a reflection on the times that it was brought um, into being. Um, but what I would say is that indirectly, without the protection of Rex Act, other prosecutions under different legislation might not have been able to be brought, um, and the London is a good example of that. Um, when um, objects have been unlawfully salvaged and, and sold on the, on the, the open market. So um, because, because, of, because of the wording of the Act, it's having been a um, practitioner in enforcing laws, the, the wording is very broad and, and uh, interpretations um, would need to be looked at at court um, unfortunately not that many prosecutions have been brought under the act um, even though it's 50 years old right okay that's very helpful I, I also wanted to say that we weren't trying to preempt the CIFA conference next week and its review but it's it's helpful this I think to give people a sort of an airing before next Wednesday of the issues and the uh, the, the various alternatives Julie you wanted to say something I saw a finger going up yeah, I think, and it and it feeds into this same uh, issue. Absolutely agree. Scheduling is great because of the additional access, but absolutely have the protection of Rex Act in the arsenal to use when absolutely needed. I think what we need to realise also is that we are um, missing our third level of protection in the, an equivalent to, for instance, listed buildings on land, because there are the vast majority of our um, historic wrecks have absolutely no protection uh, at all. And with increased marine development and um, activity in the marine zone, just look at all the offshore wind farms and all the work going on, um, we need recognition to be able to have those vessels of local and regional significance really um, flagged up um, more than just being an entry in the um, monuments record. I think, can I just elaborate on that? Because I think you made a very good point. I mean, we've got 57, is it, protected wrecks out of the tens of thousands of wrecks, many of which are First and Second World War, which are now terribly significant. And you're saying we, we need better recognition. We need better, better recognition of these important monuments. OK? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, uh, otherwise, you know, they are just their dots on the they're, they're dots that are all so densely packed together when you look at the monument record. Um, and we need to have some of those um, really recognised for their importance um, for a whole and links to a whole wide range of local and regional um, significance issues in terms of you know reflecting local industries, um, local communities as well. Okay, who else would like to chip in? Anything from Northern Ireland? Uh, well, then just just to follow up, and I think it's already said that yeah, you know, we find like the the problem with the Re Protection Rex Act is it's very narrow remit. Um, and in uh, the prior to us having the scheduling, yes, it was absolutely brilliant to have, um, even if it wasn't particularly well utilized. But I do think now that 
we have a much more likelihood of prosecution under the Historic Monuments Act than we ever would under the Protection of Wrecks Act. And we will probably look, I don't know, just speaking personally, but I, I personally think we will probably just move the Girona to scheduling or double do it and basically still have it in the Protection Rex Act, but also schedule the site. <laughs> um, because it doesn't make any difference. We, we have multiple sites which currently they are covered by several pieces of different legislation. I mean, there's plenty that are scheduled and listed. So both, they can be taken to court for both. So we're quite happy to do that. Thank you very much. Can I, Emma, sorry, Peter. Can I say something as well? Yes. Um, the uh, Protection of Rex Act limits diving. When the tide goes out, wrecks like the Amsterdam, there are many of them, are exposed. And the Act doesn't stop people walking up to the wrecks and doing well it stops them doing damage but it doesn't stop them walking up to the wrecks and uh, unless the wreck is policed they can do damage so i just put that into the pot as well yeah interesting. That's, the, that's the thing in respect of the the change in view from historic england the wrecks such as the seat and Karoo up in the northeast uh, and the amsterdam if we were to consider those uh, rec sites now, they're more likely to be scheduled than um, included in the Protection of Recs Act, um, just for that particular right. reason. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, just two last questions. Jane Maddox would like to speak. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just thinking, um, we have an enormous force of recreational divers who can actually feel quite protective towards a wreck. I think we could think about harnessing them in a productive, positive way, not a free for all. Um, the other thing, I, which is probably off the wall, I, I would like us to consider what we mean when we say protected wreck, because as someone who's very keen on a scheduled wreck, which is very special, I sometimes feel out in the cold and unloved because when people talk about protected wrecks they always talk about the 73 act but there are a lot of wrecks out there which are going to be scheduled in the near future and i would like to say that when we talk about protected wrecks that it's absolutely understood that we're embracing all the protections not just the 73 act but i'm this is possibly not the best place to do that but because most of you are, are really forward looking but it's it's just a concern that i have Thank you, Jane. I want to come back to, to, to Phil, because could you, you, you're a user of a different scheme. Um, do you want to, a, very, a very quick word on that before we go back to Terry? Um, just, do you mean on the definitions, Bob? Or? No, no, on, on the, the use of the uh, effectively your scheduling with the ability to have a high degree of protection as well compared yeah. to the protection of Rex Act. Do you think and that has an advantage? Yes, I think that that kind of um, more flexible approach um, dependent on risk and vulnerability makes sense to me. Um, you know, the decision to schedule in Scapa Flow in 2001 was was exactly for that point. We, we, we had thousands of visitors every year and licensing under the Protection of Rex Act would have been unworkable. And it's been successful in Scapa Flow. Um, but on the other hand, you know, a site like the Jerk Point Wreck when it was first discovered was highly vulnerable and managing access was absolutely the right way to go. So I would say if you're going to make changes, don't lose the licensing system, don't lose the mechanism that provides the framework to um, manage the investigation process. But yes, try and achieve some level of flexibility to enable visitors to understand and visit these sites where they're sufficiently robust to do so. That's very helpful. Uh, and I, we're, we're moving to the time where we, we should invite our audience to, to, to uh, give questions. But Ken, Terry, have you got a very quick point to finish off with? Yeah, um, just a, a couple of points, just to um, reassure Jane, I've not forgotten <laughs> that conversation we had at the licensee meeting. Uh, in February, and um, I'm hoping to be able to give you a very positive update um, in the next meeting um, before the shipwreck. 
before the shipwreck conference in uh, in Plymouth next year. Um, I've noticed in the chat um, someone raised the question about we've um, concentrated on theft, for example, from sites. Um, clearly, damage is um, mentioned in both of the pieces of legislation that we use, uh, and it really comes down to um, being able to obtain the evidence to bring successful prosecutions, uh, and that's because of the nature of the uh, of where the sites lie. So, um, just wanted to to say that. Right. Well, thank you very much. We've got to the time when we should consider our, our, our large audience and their questions. And I get to turn to Mark, if I may, who's been monitoring the chat, to pose those questions on behalf of the audience, if, if you would. And I would like people here on the panel to answer them, if, if they may. Uh, thank you, Bob. We, we have questions and we have some comments, so that, yes. you know, they're, they're not all questions. And um, I'm going to do it kind of in chronological order that they came in to give people that put their questions in, um, you know, um, making sure that everyone gets it. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase uh, a, a, a statement and a question that's come actually from the, the licensee of the London. And I'm sure that um, Terry was probably uh, has seen this already and is expecting this. And it was it, he's kind of making the point. Steve's kind of making the point that yes the designation under the protection of rex act made it possible to 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 ha have a prosecution against the theft of material from the site but in his opinion and this is interesting as a licensee his opinion is that actually there's no point in it being protected under the protection of rex act because whilst we can recover a few items that were taken off the site materials being taken off the site every day by mother nature and the the same level of uh um uh, effort isn't being put into saving those as it as was put into saving the few objects that were taken from the site which is is, a, is an is an interesting perspective to have from a from a from a licensee um uh, and that the the project was uh, uh, uh and terry knows this there was a, a feasibility study done to, as an idea of doing a different way of recovering material that's at risk and then recording it so at least we get this preservation by record um i don't know if terry wants to to reply before i then go to the next question we should, yeah. can, we, can we just keep the questions coming? We've, we've got only 10 minutes. Um, I'll be fairly brief, actually. Um, Please. I'll sort of turn the, the, the question on its head, and it's a case of what would have happened if the wreck hadn't been protected. And, and I would argue that, one, we wouldn't know as much as we do about the London as we do now, the people of South End, in particular, wouldn't be aware that they've got such an important site off their coast. We wouldn't have been able to provide the necessary training to the licensee uh, and other volunteers, as I alluded to before. Um, there wouldn't be an exhibition at the local museum, and potentially, the, I know there was talk in respect of getting something down on the pier itself. So there wouldn't be visitors coming to South End to go and visit those. So therefore, the local economy would not have benefited as much. Um, and yeah, it, unfortunately, we're not in a position where we're able to save everything. What we've got to do is to mitigate those risks and to try and support those people that are giving of their time and their money. And if it hadn't been a protected website, Steve's contribution and his commitment and his passion wouldn't be recognised by so many people. So it has a positive effect. That's Thank, what you, Thank you very much. That's very, very, very well put. Mark, next one. Uh, OK, uh, David Blackman has asked about what should be done to encourage the publication of material from protected wrecks. I suppose drawing on Julie's point that she made about the research potential not being fully realised and the backlog of archives. Somebody? I'll, I'll come in on that because it's a, it's, it's a historic issue to rest really here as well with really exciting excavations being done in the 60s and 70s and nothing coming out the back end of it. I think part of the problem is, as archaeologists in the round, we are all more interested in going down and doing the on-site stuff than doing the publications. And I think there needs to be a real look at where the money is being spent. 
um, I think there needs to be you know a recalibration where that funding is actually set aside to get these published and for us to be spending less on going out and investigating new and exciting places why would we still have stuff that's not coming out there's no point in looking for it and finding it and then not being able to tell anybody about it so that would be my personal opinion on it very interesting somebody else dave um having been involved in the publication of some historic sites it's actually very difficult because you often don't have the records and you don't have the material because they've been dissipated over time. So I think the idea is a good idea, uh, but you've got to be realistic as to what you can achieve with some of them. Um, and just in, in regards to the idea of new investigations against old publications, um, most of the new investigations are around sites at risk where there's a pressing need to do something now. And that's the driver for most new things, but that's just my own experience of these things. Thank you. Yes, Julie, I see your finger up, quickie. Yeah, uh, definitely um, an area. Is your where, area? Uh, well, de no, definitely, yeah, very passionate about maritime archaeological archives and working with them. Um, obviously done some work on a number of them. I think it's really important to realise that these archives are... Um, often at risk but they're also that sometimes the only way that the public can kind of interact with our protected rec sites so it's very much important that we do take them through analysis and, and publication um there are problems in that they're split all over the place um different um public and private sources so it does take work and that analysis needs um doing and i think um we talk about get, uh, releasing that research potential um i think you know we, we don't have um lots of thematic studies we don't have um type type series or any reference collections for our maritime archaeological um artifacts and that's all tied into this kind of historic uh, dislocation of um of archives particularly in england where it's quite an acute problem um that we don't have um kind of a lead for those um archives and pushing forward with the analysis and publication so i think that's all bundled up together thank you thank you Terry, we ought to move to the next question. So just, just a sentence, please. Yeah, just, just quickly on archiving. Uh, I mentioned the Stirling Castle, uh, the Queen Royal, Royal Anne Ganny. There's a publication forthcoming for the London. Um, and it's something, that, uh, archiving is something that we're actively encouraging. Um, the Church Rock site down in Tynmouth, we've um, got a project as part of the celebrations of the PW50 that um, is coming to uh, conclusion um in a couple of weeks time well that's very encouraging and possibly answer some of david blackman's questions um where are you mark you're back in the left hand corner <laughs> over to you of course uh so nick asked uh, dave and jane both both highlighted the issue of aging licensees i can't believe dave's one of the youngest uh how can how dave can we... is the youngest by the way <laughs> not the youngest i'm younger than him <laughs> uh anyway how can we engage with the younger generation both immediately and in the longer term is there a role for the diving agencies in this that's the question jane don't know you there. You're muted. In the meantime, I'll move to um She's back. Jane, you're back on now. Did you, did you, did you, get, did you get the question? Yes. I think this is very Okay. I'm, muted. I'm, I'm muted. sorry, I'm, I'm going to have to say we can't hear you. I've muted Jane because I'm afraid it's right. I think Let's start again. Yes, I did hear the question. Um, yes, I think this role for the driving agency. Oh, I'm, ve I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. We're going me. to have to. Um, I think it needs. Yeah, I'm afraid Jane, I think Jane's doing it on a 4G on a mobile device um, okay. and is um, struggling. If I can. I, uh, from the NES's perspective, who's one of its remits, I suppose. No, Jane, can you can you desist, please, because it's coming through and we can't hear it. I think I, you know, I've been at the NES for twenty two years now, and and have done been done many courses, building on. I think I did my very first course with Dave as a tutor, um, encouraging recreational divers to learn a skill and give their uh, their diving a, a purpose. 
um so that they can you know do do something be be project driven or you know um uh, outcome driven but over the 22 years the ability to draw people in the the way of is getting harder and harder and harder the, the you know the other things they can that they, they're doing with their skills with their with their training the other opportunities that are available to them budget constraints that they've got but also i think there's an element of of them of things that they can actively get involved with because the the number of volunteering opportunities to cut your teeth and learn skills with projects that are delib- are deliberately trying to bring in large numbers of recreational drivers are few and far between nowadays nowadays um there are some and there are some good pra- and lots you know people in the room uh digitally uh, are, are doing are doing this in but it, we're all doing it in tiny little ways and what we don't have is a big any sort of landmark um project that people can go ah that can change we heard yesterday in the video about how it changed people's lives getting involved in something like the mary rose changed people's lives um and they wouldn't have imagined they were still doing this now for a career, let alone, you know, for, for fun and, uh, and volunteering in it. Um, and we just haven't had that inspirational project for, for such a long time. Next question. Okay. So, uh, da, 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 da. we had a comment. It's more of a comment than a question, but maybe we can draw a question out of this. And it goes back to the archives, but the physical archives, the storage and management of artifacts, um, uh, and often this landing on the on small museums, uh, taking on huge uh, uh, archives uh, and the constraints that that puts on them. And I don't know if anyone's got any on you know um, firsthand experience uh, of that and any ideas for how to. You know best practice for dealing with that peter yes comes, i have peter comes from the museum background <laughs> yes because i came from a museum background and i had exactly this problem so um and, and basically i was involved with creating a museum the shipwreck museum at hastings and we get something like 60 70 000 visitors a year uh we pay our way through donations and grants and so on and it's been going for nearly 40 years. Uh, so th- that is one of the ways of, of dealing with this. Otherwise, Hastings Museum, it's a thing with local history. And the Amsterdam is just what happened over a few months. Uh, the wreck of that, that ship, there are other ships in the area, but these are not, these are only a peripheral bit of the local history which is what the museum is about so there wouldn't be anywhere for things to go i was very grateful and glad that the objects found by the treasure hunters in 1969 went to the uh, to the dutch national maritime museum the skateboard museum uh, otherwise they wouldn't have a home they would have ended up being sold well i noticed that the clock has moving swiftly to, to 12 30 which i think is the witching hour uh, we've got to call it a day here really haven't we mark uh we are we're, we're coming to people's lunch breaks uh yes. they have been sitting in front of computers all morning so um, i think we ought to say thank you very much indeed to all the panel for for taking the time and for your hearing your expertise and also thank you to all our members at the conference for their questions and and their interest and um thank you mark for organizing it <laughs>